This show is sponsored by Headnote, helping law firms get paid 70% faster with their compliant e-payments and accounts receivables automation platform. Learn how to get paid quicker and more efficiently at headnote.com. Welcome to this episode of the Modern Law Library. I'm Olivia Aguilar from ABA Publishing, and I'll be today's host. In this episode, I speak with Jeff T. Frederick, the author of Mastering Voir Dire and Jury Selection, Gain an Edge in Questioning and Selecting Your Jury. Jeff is the director of the Jury Research Services Division of the National Legal Research Group, Incorporated. This division provides research and assistance to attorneys in addressing the problems faced in trying cases before juries. He has assisted attorneys in the application of social science research methods to jury selection and persuasion issues since 1975. His firm is the recipient of the Virginia Lawyers Weekly Reader's Choice Award for Best Jury Trial Consulting Service in each of the last three years. Today, Jeff discusses how to conduct effective voir dire and the skills needed to be successful when selecting a jury. Jeff, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. All right, so let's uh, get started. First, could you kind of discuss your background and how you became a jury expert? Well, to do that, we have to go back in time quite a ways. Um, back in 1975, um, I was a graduate student at North Carolina State University pursuing my master's and PhD, and I was interested in researching law and psychology. Uh, and there was a fairly famous trial, the Joanne Little trial, uh, that was happening at the time. Uh, they asked for volunteers, and uh, myself and a friend of mine uh, volunteered, where we did compositional challenge, venue mode and then eventually jury selection. And basically, that was where I got started. Uh, And I've been working in the area, conducting research, um, practicing, speaking, and writing books uh, for the last 40 years. Great. So what inspired you to write about this topic, jury selection? Well, it is it is like the one of the, the, the perfect interfaces of social science research with uh, practical decision making. And there also is uh, a need for uh, learning how to conduct it more effectively because this is something that really isn't taught in law schools. And so it really mm-hmm. was kind of a perfect niche for my desire to kind of pass on this kind of knowledge and a need for it. Um, so this is the fourth edition of the book. Uh, could you kind of talk about the new information that's included in this uh, new edition? Well, sure. Uh, I basically have uh, updated all the chapters, uh, and I have included a new chapter uh, on courts martial, uh, and basically expanding also the tips that will be appearing in the in the book, uh, the revision of the internet chapter, which is really changing how we conduct jury selection uh, in our courtrooms today. Also, I've expanded the discussion of uh, supplemental juror questionnaires and uh, something that that may not be obvious, but um, what we've done is that we we had uh, 130 supplemental juror questionnaires included in the last edition uh, in a CD appendix. And what we've done now is that we've gone online and we have, um, I think, about 190 uh, supplemental juror questionnaires from both criminal and civil cases. Uh, and it really is a good resource, and all you have to do is use a code to have access to it. Nice. So you start off the book talking about the goals of jury selection. Um, and it is to select an impartial jury, obviously. And when it comes to voir dire, um, you list four major goals. Could you discuss these goals and why they're so critical? Sure. In the book, we talk about the four goals and then and approaches of how to achieve them. But basically, the four goals are one is information gathering, and that's our most important goal. Uh, what we need to do is to uncover the information necessary, and that is backgrounds, experiences, and opinions and biases of jurors to intelligently exercise peremptory challenges and challenges for cause. Uh, this is the goal that probably is the only one that is uniformly recognized by the courts. And what we have to do is to design our questioning, both in terms of how we phrase the questions and how we ask the questions, to maximize juror candor and honesty. The second goal is rapport. And this is where attorneys can benefit or lawyers can benefit from building a positive relationship with jurors. And we can do that by treating the jurors with respect, uh, showing an interest in jurors as individuals, 
um, making jurors feel comfortable in the process, and sharing a personal side of yourself to the jurors. And this is what we call um, disclosure reciprocity. And that basically is if you share something about yourself to jurors, they're going to feel a subtle pressure to return or reciprocate that and share about them. Now, what we find with uh, good rapport is that it you know, facilitates uh, openness and candor. It also facilitates a positive feeling towards lawyers or you as a lawyer, and it facilitates trust. And what we find is that those taken together can lead to greater dis- uh, disclosure and greater persuasion as you get in the trial. Now, the third goal is education. Now, Jurors, and oftentimes uh, jurors, hold views that are inconsistent with the roles and duties of jurors. That is, they may presume the guilt of the defendant, or they um, may feel that that whatever their own personal view of what the outcome should be, that that is really what should take precedence, no matter what the, the judge's instructions are. Now, voir dire is an excellent opportunity to educate or use an educational function to promote an understanding and a willingness to follow the laws and duties uh, of their of themselves being jurors. Now, with education, um, we have to remember uh, that we have to establish the critical viewpoint and determine whether or not it's a result of a misunderstanding versus a deeply held belief. You know, misunderstandings are correctable. Deeply held beliefs are less changeable. Uh, So what we want to do in terms of education is that we want to basically uncover the depth of the belief before we engage, engage in any educational function. Otherwise, it's going to compromise, first of all, our ability to really understand the juror, and second of all, it compromises any challenges for cause. So what we have to do is is remember to gather the information first and then educate, uh, and the importance of education comes from the fact that if jurors understand what their role is, what they're to do before they hear the information that they do at trial, their decision will be different than if they're told after they've heard everything, this is what you're supposed to do. And that's the value of education uh, in this kind of setting. And then finally, we have the fourth goal, which is persuasion. And this is controversial and it's uniformly condemned by the courts. However, it is a fact of life. One of the reasons that you have persuasion being possible in the void year setting is that jurors are not anticipating a persuasive attempt. They're basically, you know, in essence, suspending that aspect of they know what lawyers do and lawyers try to persuade people. They suspend that aspect because they go, well, that'll happen once the trial begins. Well, the first thing to encounter is voir dire, uh, and so that's where it becomes something that uh, you can use the voir dire process to, um, in essence, move your case along. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I thought that the, the beginning of the book was um, laid out well with all four goals and just how, you know, how important information is in, in voir dire. And chapter three was uh, especially fascinating to me. It kind of lays out how to understand jurors um, nonverbal communication. And you mentioned two different types, uh, visual and auditory. Could you touch on a couple of examples of each and how they can be used to select a juror? First, a couple of basics. Uh, one is that we're looking for signs of anxiety or positive and negative affect. Uh, second is that we have to recognize that there's no Pinocchio effect. That is, the juror's nose doesn't grow longer if they're trying to mislead <laughs> you or something to that effect. Uh, and and third uh, is that the, we have to recognize that the same cue can be exhibited for different reasons. Uh, for example, if someone, uh, we call it uh, adopting a more closed or orientation if they fold their you know fold their arms across their chest um, that could be an indication of less receptivity to the the person who they're talking to also uh, they may do that because the uh, the AC has just been turned on in the courtroom and it's cold and, and you're conserving body heat uh, so we have to keep mm-hmm. those things in mind but but as you said uh, there are two types of, of uh, cues one is visual that is what we see in the second is auditory what we hear. And in terms of a a few uh, uh, cues to keep in mind, 
One is body movement. Um, that is, the greater the movement, the greater the anxiety. Uh, here we see you know, people or jurors wringing their hands. They may be tapping their toes. They may be engaging in other behaviors that dissipate nervous energy. Uh, they may engage in what we call self-adaptive movements, which are basically uh, you know, kind of grooming gestures. Uh, it may be picking invisible lint off their clothes or, or maybe uh, pulling on their hair or brushing back their hair. Uh, and I, I, I should mention a more dramatic example of that uh, is there is a potential juror in the Aurora th- uh, theater shootings who was literally, during voir dire, pulling out clumps of her hair. Uh, she was so oh, wow. nervous and anxious, exactly, of, of, uh, about sitting in that particular case. Another uh, cue is body orientation, uh, and and here you, you, we have kind of a, an open versus closed orientation. The more open the orientation, the greater the receptivity, the the less nervousness, and then we tend to close off uh, when become nervous or anxious. Now. What if you can kind of, and since we're doing this um, just auditorially ourselves here, uh, if the listener can kind of imagine that when we come, become nervous or anxious or defensive, we're going to protect uh, a certain part of our body, and it's going to be above the neck and, uh, excuse me, below the neck and above the knees. Uh, so you'll see uh, when someone becomes anxious, nervous, defensive, they're, they're going to um, pull their arms together, folding their arms across their body. They will tend to cross their legs. And in some situations, they will tend to start to orient their body away from the person with whom they're speaking. For example, you might get the shoulder moving towards you if you're talking to the juror at that particular time. Uh, and this kind of closed orientation can indicate a degree of discomfort with either the topic area or perhaps with you. Next, you have body posture. Uh, and here we're talking about the rigidity of the posture. That is, the greater rigidity, the greater the anxiety. You know, here you have the clasping of the uh, hand hands on the arms of the chairs. Uh, You have the kind of complete lack of movement of the body uh, during where you would expect to have some normal movement going on. Also, you may see the the clenching of the jaw, the jaw muscle to where it starts bulging, uh, where the juror may, may be saying something that is uh, a correct or desired answer, but not really believing it and kind of like forcing it out through the teeth. And a final cue that we'll talk about, and there's a, a, a number of them in the book, um, is facial cues. And we can get a lot of information from your facial cues, but we have to remember that the face is the area that we have most Con, uh, conscious control over. Uh, that is, we've learned how to frame attention. We've learned how to smile when we don't really feel like smiling. So what we want to do is keep that in mind, but then pay attention to when jurors, in essence, leak. Uh, and what we're looking for, uh, leaking is basically the, where uh, they will exhibit an expression uh, and then pull it back and go back to a more neutral expression. And so uh, what we're still in facial expressions, we're still going to be looking for signs of positive or negative affect, uh, looks of disgust, looks of concern, incredulity, uh, these kind of things, and basically recognize that it is under our the greatest control. But fortunately, jurors really tend not to be consummate actors. Uh, and so you look at that, you look at is the facial expression consistent Consistent with the rest of the body, you know. For example, are they smiling at you, but then they have their whole orientation away from you, and they're giving you the cold shoulder? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you look for that kind of consistency. Now, uh, in terms of auditory cues, that is what we hear. Uh, you have speech disturbances, uh, which are disruptions in the pattern of speech, you know, word repetitions. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem with the defendant not testifying, or I don't have a problem with providing money for pain and suffering. Uh, these kind of disruptions in the normal flow of the speech pattern. Another cue is the amount of speech. And here, generally, uh, the more comfortable you are with somebody, the more willing you are to engage in a conversation. And you, the amount, the total amount of speech, you know, increases with your comfort level. Uh, and so uh, what we want to do is pay attention to to that. Do, we, do they talk with you? 
in the same amount of speech as they do when they talk to the other side during voir dire. That could indicate a greater uh, ease with one side or the other. Now, an exception to this is what we call irrelevant speech. Now, ir irrelevant speech is where, yes, they have provided some words, but do those words really answer the question? And the answer is no. Um, you know, there's an example in my book. Uh, and I worked with the um, Office of Independent Counsel in the prosecution of, of Oliver North in the Iran-Contra affair. And there was an examination of one witness, or, well, excuse me, one juror, when uh, the prosecutor asked, you know, if she'd be able to convict the defendant. And, and the, the juror, potential juror says, well, you know, the truth is God's friend, you know, and that's that kind of an answer. And and then you notice that, wait a minute, that didn't really answer the question. And the prosecutor continued. He thought she'd answered, and he'd continued and then said, basically, and if you felt that, you know, all the evidence you felt that Oliver North was guilty, you convict him. Uh, and then she said, no, I couldn't do that. You know, and then she went on to say that, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't there. I couldn't make that kind of decision. But the key to that is is that by listening to the answer, you can determine whether or not are they really answering the question? And that's, that's the key with the, the, the exception in terms of irrelevant speech. Uh, and then the final auditory uh, cue uh, that I'd like to mention is that of word choice. Uh, and here we have two different aspects. One is psychological distancing. Uh, and psychological distancing is the amount of distance I put between myself and the object about which I'm speaking. So a juror could talk about the defendant as the defendant, which is kind of a distance or a pushing away of the object being the defendant, or something a little bit closer is it could talk about Mr. Smith, who is the defendant, or could even have even closer and say Billy Ray Bob, you know, uh, that the first names of the, of the defendant, something like that. That allows it to be closer to uh, the person. Uh, and, you know, and I've been in cases before where jurors will refer, uh, potential jurors will refer to the victim by her first name. Uh, when they have no connection at all, but what they're showing is, is an, a degree of identification um, with the victim. Now, the, the other aspect of word choice is uh, the negation conjunction, conjunction but. You know, I can be fair, but, you know, I, I don't want to make mm -hmm. plaintiffs rich. Or I can be fair, but, you know, I heard he confessed, you know. And this, you know, whenever you hear that kind of thing, you, you need to engage in the exercise of let's just cross out everything before but and then consider what was said after that. Um, and that's where you'll get the real value of that. Um, now, in terms of nonverbal communication, uh, when, in terms of like putting it all together, what we want to do is that we want to, uh, first of all, establish a baseline. And that's just scientists talk for, you know, how um, anxious, nervous are they at the very beginning of voir dire, just being in that situation, what is their baseline level of anxiety or nervousness? And then we evaluate the changes in their behavior as a function of who asked the questions and what questions are being asked. Um, also, we want to look for support figures. That is, if you happen to ask them a question that the juror is perhaps confused, uh, do they look back at you like, I'm really not sure what you're talking about? Uh, or do they look over at the other side uh, like, what is this person over here talking about? Well, I'm usually suspicious of people who look to the other side for answers or look to them for help. And finally, you know, observe jurors in the spectator section. Now, here what we're talking about, and I've been in cases before where, where attorneys, you know, they didn't want to look in the spectator section when the judge gives a general introduction to the case because uh, they're worried that the jurors would think that they're being spied on or something like that. You know, quite frankly, jurors have no idea what's supposed to happen during that beginning part of, of uh, the jury selection process. Uh, and so, so they're not viewing you as being spying. And a lot of information is being revealed in the spectator section. This is a time when jurors 
they're not in the fishbowl of being in the say the jury box. They're in amongst you know anywhere from you know 20 to 50 to 100 people, uh, and that's kind of when they let their guard down. And so you can see them reacting to uh, what the judge says the case is about or that kind of stuff. They look over at the parties and and have expressions either positive or negative and this kind of thing, uh, and that's important. Now you know, and I have seen jurors cry in the spectator section and not shed a tear uh, when it comes to Mm. them being questioned in the jury box. Interesting. While reading the book, I was really struck by just how many different nonverbal cues there are. Yeah, there's a number of nonverbal cues. And again, what we're doing is that we're looking for the pattern of their behavior. Uh, so that you know, so that you know, while you have these individual cues, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to try to sensitize you to here's you know, jurors may respond differently. They may be you know, they may be channeling out in different cues, but I just want you to be you know, looking for how are they behaving uh, in total so that you're not missing certain things about their behavior uh, because we, you know, in, in general, we basically have, um, you know, very little information to go on during voir dire in a lot of jurisdictions. And this is just another, uh, you, know, a, you know, tool in your tool shed for how can we get to understand who these jurors are. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Before we move on, we're going to take a quick commercial break to hear from our sponsors. Hey, law firms. Getting paid is fantastic, but dealing with accounts receivable is such a pain. What if there was a better way? In her head note, an industry-leading compliant e-payments and AR automation system. Their unique blend of features cuts through the noise and helps you to get paid 70% faster. Skip the paper checks, spreadsheets, and awkward calls to overdue clients. Get paid faster with less effort. Visit headnote.com for more information. Welcome back to the Modern Law Library. We're speaking with Jeff Frederick, the author of Mastering Voir Dire and Jury Selection. So your book contains a lot of uh, tips and discussions of both how to develop questions and how to conduct voir dire more effectively, particularly in a group setting. Um, Could you relay some of those tips for our listeners? Be happy to. Um, First, let's take question development. That is, how can we phrase questions to get what we need? Uh, you know, one tip is to capitalize on open-ended questions. And open-ended questions, either questions like, you know, how do you feel about X? Or tell me about this. Um, or tell me about your views on this. These are open-ended questions. Close-ended questions are your kind of yes or no questions, uh, agree, disagree kind of, kind of questions. And basically what we find with open-ended questions is that we get more information out of open-ended questioning than in closed-ended questioning. Uh, it gives us not only – not only are there a number of reasons why you would answer yes or no to a question, and with an open-ended question, you're given a gateway into that, but you also get – to get a view of the juror's cognitive sophistication, if you will, their level of articulateness, their way of framing and answering the question back to you. And that can give us more information on who these jurors are. Uh, A second tip is to avoid phrases that trigger the socially desirable response bias. That is phrasing such as bias, prejudice, or, you know, do you understand the law that says, uh, you know, with, with, with these kind of questions, uh, you know, with the do you understand question, I mean, you know, very rarely is a juror going to raise their hand and say, I don't know about these other jurors here, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, you, know, mm-hmm. the, you know, they, you know, it really is, you know, the, the socially desirable response bias is really the looking good response. We want people to like us generally, uh, and we want to look good in the eyes of others. Uh, but if we use these phrases, we trigger uh, kind of the ob- the obvious answer. Well, of of course I'm not prejudiced. Of course I'm not biased. I mean, jurors don't wake up in the morning and all of a sudden, you know, come out of bed and they stretch and go, well, wait a minute. I'm feeling particularly biased and prejudiced. I'm going to go down to the courthouse and do me some justice today. You know, they don't do that. You know, we really have a blind mm-hmm. spot to our own biases. So what we don't want to do is that we don't want to trigger those. You know, we're, you know there's going to be a, a, a tendency to uh, try to do in impression management and make yourself look good, but we don't want to give them the obvious way of doing so. Uh, and a second tip 
uh, another tip is to um, highlight undesirable or prohibitive behavior as compared to bias. Uh, and that is, you know, we're going to talk about, would you need more evidence? Uh, would you tend to lean towards a party? Would you, would, is the burden, do you think the burden is too high or too low? Uh, and, you know, you notice I'm not mentioning bias and prejudice. What I'm doing is that I'm mentioning the manifestations of those biases and prejudices. Uh, and so by recognizing, let's not trigger it, and actually let's go around it and and give them manifestations which they may not know are bad, you know, um, and mm-hmm. use that as a way of, of demonstrating to the court that this person uh, is biased or prejudiced. Uh, next, we have... Um, designing the questions with a bad answer in mind. Uh, And that is basically, if you know that if you heard a juror say a particular answer, that you'd go, oh, that would be, for me, that would be a peremptory challenge or perhaps even a challenge for cause. If you know of that kind of answer and you go through, you, you are in the void year process and you haven't heard that yet, you need to ask about it. You know, if you have reason to believe that people in the trial venari will have certain bad opinions, just because it hasn't been volunteered to you doesn't mean it's not out there. And you want to confirm, or that it, at least confirm it's not out there, and more than likely reveal that it is out there by asking them the question about, you know, for example, you know, how many of you believe that if it's not in the record, it never happened? You know, in terms of medical negligence cases, and mm-hmm. just go ahead. You you ask the question with that bad answer in mind to make sure that people out there don't have it. Uh, Another tip is to focus on difficulty versus ability. You know, a lot of times attorneys will ask questions, would you be able to or can you, you know, be fair and impartial, whatever you want to do, you know, they phrase it in an ability framework. Well, what we find in the research is that people are more willing to, rec- uh, to willing to admit that they would have difficulties, problems, reservations in doing something as compared to saying that they wouldn't be able to do it. And since we want to find out those people who have difficulties, problems, and reservations in doing so, we need to actually phrase the question in that manner so that we can elicit that kind of response. And, and finally, uh, in terms of question development, is consider contrasting competing positions in your question. You know, this is the classic, you know, some people believe this, other people believe that. Which is closer to your view? And so you have kind of a good or bad, you know, the one side versus the other. Uh, and what you're doing are, you know, is two things. One is that you're, you're letting them know that people have similar beliefs as they have, no matter which side they're on. And so they're more likely to go, well, if some people believe that, I'll, I'll tell you, I believe that too. The second thing uh, is that, that we're forcing them to choose. So that, you know, which side are they, are they going to go to the good side or the bad side if they are given a, you know, given a choice that they have to choose one or the other. And so going to the bad side is, is never a good side. Now, the second part of your question addressed the, you know, conducting, you know, voir dire or, you know, in particular group voir dire. And, you know, in, in the book, we, you know, spend a lot of time or I spend a lot of time talking about uh, various tips on all these points here. But I'll, I'll go ahead and, and talk about just a few of them. One is that we want to set the stage for jurors. You know, at the very beginning of, of void year, we're having a conversation with jurors. I don't care if it's one juror, five jurors, 50 jurors, 100 jurors. I've been in all those situations. We are having a conversation with them. We're not having a job interview because everybody puts on their, their, their best psychological suit or dress or pantsuit or whatever. And we don't want to interrogate jurors. Uh, what we do is we want to have a conversation. Your questioning will be more relaxed. It'll be more uh, open to them, and their answers to you are going to be a little bit easier to give. We're going to be telling them there's no right or wrong answers, only honest and candid ones. And we're also going to convert bias to something else. We'll call it, you know, perhaps call it filters. Uh, the people, you know, all have these biases or, you know, I, I tend to call them filters. Uh, and you're kind of letting jurors know, okay, filters is a good way of talking about this. I'm more willing to admit that I might have some filters as a result of how I grew up and the opinions and experiences that I have as compared to admitting that I have a bias. So I would go with filters. Um, next, in group questioning, we want to get 
get the jurors talking in the very beginning or participating in the very beginning. Now, we can do this by uh, one approach is the initial background summary. Uh, and that's basically, you know, ideally this is done when you have maybe a panel of anywhere from 7 to 12 or 14. They're up in the box. Uh, and basically you just go down the line and have each juror give the answers to uh, four or five questions. You know, what's your name? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, where do you live? You know, what do you do inside the home or outside the home? And, and then I like to throw in, uh, you know, what are your favorite uh, spare time activities or hobbies? Uh, that's just because I'm a psychologist. It's something that might be a little more interesting. Now, while the answers may be uh, useful, the approach here is to simply – break the ice and let them feel comfortable with speaking in a group so that what we do is that each person by the end of it, each person has basically spoken in open court. Uh, and so we've kind of break, broken the ice there. The other uh, approach, and, and you have to remember in group questioning, usually it's a matter of people raise their hands in response to a question. Uh, and so what we want to do is engage in initial hand raising. We want everybody to start off by raising their hands. Now you can either do that by by asking a question that's based on some juror qualification, uh, you know, how long have you lived? You know, how many of you have lived in the community for six months? If that was a qualification, we can also do that uh, if you have a more relaxed style. You can also do that by telling jurors that you know. You know, jurors have told me in the past that kind of first time they raised their hand, it was probably a little bit more difficult, uh, and then after that, it was all it was all just fine. So let's do uh, your fellow jurors a favor and let's everybody raise their hand, uh, and then you get everybody raise their hand. Usually, it, it, there's some chuckles and that kind of thing to where it kind of breaks the ice in terms of your relationship with them too. Another tip is to, once we get them participating, we have to keep them participating. And one way of doing that is something called the springboard method. Uh, and the springboard method is where you go into a topic and you tell them, okay, we're going to be talking about lawsuits, their views on lawsuits nowadays. Uh, and then you introduce a topic and then say, well, Mr. Jones, could you tell me what your thoughts are on lawsuits? And then Mr. Jones gives the answer. You then go, okay, Ms. Smith, uh, can you tell me your views? And you go around the group until uh, until you either have talked to everybody and you know everybody's opinion, or if you are not going to go through that, uh, what you can do, what you need to do is then do a poll. Uh, so that once you've talked to a few people, then you can say, okay, how many of you agree with Ms. Jones who said X, Y, and Z? How many agree with Mr. Smith or have mm -hmm. had a similar experience? Uh, and in this way, you know what everybody in the group feels on this. And also, by, at, by doing the, the kind of springboard method, jumping around the box, everybody has to be prepared and everybody is basically basically on the verge of talking. You know, they know they're going to have to do it. So it's a really good approach to keep them participating. Now, of course, you need to be persistent. Uh, that's another tip uh, in terms of we don't want let, to let jurors hide. Um, I occasionally have uh, an attorney, you know, may raise like, well, I had this juror here, didn't say a thing in void dear, but then in the jury room, the juror just kind of took over things. Well, you know, in, in my response to that situation, it was always the same. Is it who's in charge? You know, in void dear, who's in charge? Mm -hmm. The attorney's in charge. The attorney, if you have not, if you have not heard from a juror, there's nothing to prevent you in, in most jurisdictions from simply saying, well, Mr. Jones, I haven't had a chance to talk to you. Could you tell me your feelings on this? Uh, and so there's really no need for you to have a juror who has not uh, participated uh, and expressed an opinion or have a chance to talk to him. Because you have to remember is that just because the juror doesn't say anything doesn't mean they have good views. It, it doesn't mean, you know, they can easily have bad views. They just haven't told you it and they'll take it with them into the deliberation room. You know, and finally, uh, and, you know, this is it's really kind of an, a no-brainer and easy one, but it's sometimes something that the attorneys forget to do. And that is you, you kind of a cleanup question or your last chance question. You know, basically, you know, is, is there anything I didn't ask about or in light of the questioning that we've had this morning, anything I should know about you now? And while you might not get, you know, a response every time you conduct four deer, uh, I can guarantee you that over time, you're going to all of a sudden catch a couple of people who 
for whatever reason, didn't bring something up earlier, who now take the opportunity, knowing it's their last chance, take the opportunity to let you know. Uh, and, and that is something mm-hmm. that's extremely valuable. Thank you for sharing those helpful tips. There's a lot of them, and they're, they're very helpful. So chapter eight of the book covers jurors in the internet. Uh, you start off the chapter with a few examples of jurors who conducted internet research prior to trial. Um, could you talk about the results of uh, those examples you write about? Sure, sure. You know, one one was uh, from a uh, you know, and and this is I, I have to say, and to be to start off with, is that the internet has transformed jury selection and how jurors participate in the process of jury trials. Uh, it really has changed things, you know, since, uh, you know, for the last basically uh, five years to 10 years. It's, it's been amazing to see what's happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, it, you know, it has caused a lot of problems, too. Uh, and, you know, and I gave a couple of those problems early. Uh, you know, we had a criminal, there was a criminal case uh, in uh, San Francisco where uh, a judge was questioning uh, the jurors, and one juror revealed a, you know, a fairly detailed knowledge of the case, and the judge kept on talking to him. Uh, and the juror eventually said that that he had done some internet research beforehand in anticipation of the case. The judge went on to question other jurors and found a number of other jurors who um, had done online research about the case in before they came in. Uh, and what happened in there uh, in in that particular case is the judge went ahead and dismissed the entire venari of 600 people uh, and had to bring in a new venari. Another uh, example is uh, what I call the blogging juror. It was a criminal uh, criminal case uh, where the juror had a blog, uh, and mental note to everybody, if a juror has a blog, you better find out about it and keep that in mind, uh, because if you are uh, someone who blogs, in essence, puts their opinion out as if other people should be paying attention to it, uh, they have, uh, they're potentially going to be influential in the, uh, the jury room, uh, and they actually may not be able to resist the temptation of blogging about your case. Uh, and this particular case, you had a, a blogging juror who did blog about the case, who even went to the extent of taking uh, photographs uh, of the murder weapon on his cell phone, and then then when he got home, uh, uploading it to his blog. Uh, he even set up a chat room uh, where he could talk to people about the case. Now, this was you know, the the jury convicted the defendant. Um, this juror was uh, and held in, uh, in you know, ruled as having engaged in misconduct, but the verdict was affirmed. Uh, affirmed basically with the judge saying that, look, there's no other verdict that could be reached in this particular case. And finally, uh, probably one of my favorite examples is uh, this came from uh, a a jury trial in England, a criminal case in which a juror was unsure how uh, she was to vote. Um, So she decided to hold a poll on Facebook. Uh, And so she posted details of the case uh, with the request, and I quote, I don't know which way to go. So I'm holding a poll. Uh, and fortunately, the judge received an anonymous tip about this uh, before deliberations, and actually also the fact that there were a number of people who had uh, had recommended uh, a guilty verdict in the poll. Uh, and what the judge did is that the judge went ahead and dismissed a juror because it was before deliberations, and. Um, the trial continued. Uh, one other example, uh, just another one from uh, in England, is in a number of jurors who have engaged in this kind of research and uh, have actually been sentenced to jail time in England. Uh, we're not doing that here, although we've had some people who had maybe spent one or two days in jails, but that, that's basically a, a rarity. But uh, what we're seeing with with the internet uh, in jury trials is that there's a wealth of information out there available through internet searches, through media posting on cases, through databases such as voter registration and political mm-hmm. donations, and the jurors' social media accounts. And that's something that that we all have to be on top of uh, as we approach trial. Um, in his endorsement of the book, Morris Dees, uh, who's the founder and chief trial attorney uh, for the Southern Poverty Law Center, states that jury selection is often the least known trial lawyer skill. Why do you think this important skill is so overlooked? Well, you know, Morris, um, you know, makes a, a, a valid point. Um, that is, in law schools, attorneys aren't trained 
uh, about you know how to conduct four deer and how you know what to do in in the jury selection area, and in fact it's more or less to be on the job training or maybe with supplemental CLEs. Uh, and I have attorneys come up to me all the time that, that say, you know, gee, I wish I had known this in the beginning when I started practice, or I wish I had received this training in law schools. And I've actually, and I actually have gone and done programs at law schools. But you know, I think it's primarily that you know it, you have this kind of leftover of, well, that's we just we just did it on the job, and that's just how we did it, and we have other more important things to cover. But you know, part of that, you know, it's failing to recognize that that being good at voyeur and jury selection is not just a knack that everybody has and that you can just throw yourself into the courtroom and, and you can do this thing. You know, I, you know, in my book, I talk a lot, you know, of the recommendations that I make are based on research. Uh, and these are designed to help people be more effective in doing it. And what, you know, one of the reasons that I uh, originally wrote the book, uh, and by the way, the first edition w- was in 1995, mm-hmm. was to approach voidir and jury selection from a comprehensive perspective, you know, bringing together social science research and practical experience to help attorneys uh, be more effective in voidir and jury selection and try to take some of the guesswork out of it, try to take some of the, the needless mistakes that can happen that pose barriers to you effectively uh, getting information from jurors that you know attorneys would not have access to uh, just simply walking into the courtroom or maybe you know having a mentor within their firm because the mentor within their firm had to learn it on the job before them and and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're picking up the best on how to approach this mm-hmm. great uh, is there anything else you'd like to discuss today I think probably uh, besides my, uh, you know, my plea to people to really pay attention to what's happening with the Internet and how it can influence your case, uh, it can help you, but also how it can hurt you in terms with, with jurors, um, is that uh, one of the things we didn't talk about uh, and here uh, and is the use of supplemental juror questionnaires. And I just want to, you know, to tell folks that supplemental juror questions, questionnaires, which are really, you know, questionnaires given to jurors before they encounter the voir dire process to help supplement the voir dire process, and you get information on their backgrounds, experiences, and opinions, uh, is to recognize is that this is the gold standard for achieving information. That is, people are more likely to disclose information on a written form uh, as compared to in open court where they verbally have to tell you. I mean, I have seen jurors, you know, right under questionnaires, amazing responses, like their favorite activities is like smoking weed or cockfighting or, or all these kind of things that, no, they're not going to openly you know, <laughs> say that, you know, in the courtroom yeah. and that kind of thing. So I just want to make a, you know, just a, a plug for uh, you know, that there's a real value to these kind of questionnaires if they are written effectively. Definitely. And the book definitely includes some some great samples of questionnaires for a reader's resource. And where can our listeners reach you if they're interested in learning more about your work? Well, feel free to email me directly. Uh, and my email address is the letter J Frederick, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, at nlrg.com that's national legal research group.com uh, obviously they can go to our website which is www.nlrg.com uh, and then click on the tab for services and then the tab for jury research services and you will then be able to find out more about what we do great thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today jeff it was my pleasure you can purchase mastering voir dire and jury selection at the aba web store go to AmericanBar.org forward slash products. That's AmericanBar.org forward slash products. If you enjoyed this episode of the Modern Law Library, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast listening service.